extent more than 5,000 pieces of equipment are on the ground with the rest of the sustainment and support buildup arriving daily. There's a linchpin effort that goes on and essentially logistics becomes that linchpin. The buildup in Afghanistan is a 24-7 operation. In this theater, the primary logistical corridors are air and road. What kind of stuff? We get a lot of fuel tankers coming in. We need about 40 a day for sustainment and we have uh, a lot of RLBs, housing units. The lines of communication into Afghanistan are very uh, tenuous and it's terrible roads with uh, the potential enemy all around. We can fly things in, but each of the airports has a limitation because they were built during the Russian era or before. And every spot of ground outside these uh, bases that we have is potentially mined. The job for Arsent is to support the warriors, to make sure they have what they need when they need it. We're on the same team. The enemy is outside the wire, and we'll make it happen. Bill McCabe, Afghanistan. Oh. Well, there you go. Slide, please. Who is Arsen? Has anybody in here ever been assigned to the Arsen or been to Kuwait? All right. Well, it is a remarkable organization. Um, the Army Service Component Command. It has uh, command and control responsibilities, Title X responsibilities, delegated to give us the authority to make those critical logistics decisions in support of both Iraq. Afghanistan and oh by the way 20 other countries simultaneously while all of this uh, operation is going on and you can see there are the six major missions of which over 50 percent of them are what directly associated to logistics so here General Webster is commanding third army and his main effort is sustain the force so that is our responsibility is to make sure that we two things primarily that we're constantly assessing the environment and the theater and more importantly that were setting the theater. I wouldn't have known what that meant after you know, 27 years in the Army, but I know all about setting the theater today. It's a very condition-based environment. Just because we finished the Wave 1, Responsible Drawdown 1, and we now are in Responsible Drawdown 2 for Iraq, the conditions have completely changed. So we just can't take that playbook and now apply it to what we're going to do for the December 31st presidential directive and security agreements. We've got a whole new set of agreements that we need to understand and what that's going to mean from a Title 10. I can't use Title 10 dollars for Title 22. We've got to work through those authorities and get those approvals working with the department, with the Secretary of Defense, and as well as Congress. So again, that's what we do is in setting the theater, assessing the theater, and then more importantly down below is commanding and controlling operations. Third Army is now spread from Fort McPherson, we have jump talked up to Shaw Air Force Base, which is where the uh, new headquarters is going into, so the ADVON is already in place. We've got uh, two forward command posts. Uh, we've got the operational command post in Kuwait, and then we've got two command posts that were talked by General Pillsbury early, the ACE A in Afghanistan, which focuses really to help US 4 Alpha set the theater, and the other in Iraq, which is to help them remove all of the equipment out of Iraq. So. We're currently in the process of having those two headquarters communicate because we're going to transition the Afghanistan headquarters to look and feel and execute in accordance to what Iraq is doing. So the RCENT support element Iraq, because now we're moving from an equipping to a redistribution and disposition uh, mission in Afghanistan to get the, to clean up the battlefield. About five years ago, we started that process in Iraq. We didn't start responsible drawdown overnight. It started a long time ago, and that's what we're doing in Afghanistan. We're moving in now. We're building the plan to figure out how to get all that equipment moving out of Afghanistan. Slide. Nickel 2. Who's heard of Nickel 2 before? Who's heard of Nickel 1? All right. Well, this is an operation that General Webster has codenamed, and as you can see at the bottom of the chart there, General Patton shifts two divisions to support the 101st Airborne Division at Bastogne, within 48 hours. So when the call came, he responded and he shifted his forces 90 degrees uh, in the Ardennes to the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, he, after the, or during the meeting, you know, Eisenhower says, anybody can do this. And he basically put his hand up and everybody thought he was crazy when he said two days. Well, he walked out of the, the, uh, the meeting, went to the closest phone, said nickel, hung up the phone. Right away, his entire planning staff, just like this room, everybody stood up and moved out and knew exactly what they had to do. 
Well, that's where uh, General uh, Webster came up with the idea for Nickel 2. He has developed a very deliberate plan, and when the call came for Responsible Drawdown 1, Uplift 1, and now uh, Responsible Drawdown 2, we have worked very diligently with the entire enterprise, AMC, the Department of the Army, OSD, and the theater commanders to develop a plan to execute. And now what we're working is on the fringes. What are those things that we're going to have to do in the event that, oh, by the way, a volcano goes off in Iceland? Oh, by the way, we have an insurgency in Kyrgyzstan. Oh, by the way, we lose the airfield at Manas. Oh, by the way, and it just went on and on and on. So now we're really building all the branch plans to provide that warfighter flexibility because just because we wrote the main plan, it's all of the other things that we're having to deal with to ensure success and continuous support. Slide. Difficult to read here, but uh, the bottom line is uh, the top part of that chart talks to, as General Stevenson mentioned, we've been doing this a long time. We've got that process down, and we can put any force anywhere in the world now and be successful. But you know what? The conditions are different when you look at the bottom part of the chart. We've now got a clear battle space in Afghanistan. Who's, who's ever done that before? Probably not too many people. I went to pull that plan off the shelf, sir, and it wasn't there. So, uh, so we're writing that plan as we speak. How do you do distribution backwards? Okay, there's not too many FMs out there that say, okay, here's how you redeploy from a war. And, and what's the, the best way to do that? So essentially, we're putting this big engine in reverse. And we all know every party puts their heart, soul, and love into writing that plan to go into an operation. And then they worry about the guys downrange have to worry about getting the heck out of there. Okay, well, we're not going to do that. We, the community sitting in this room here today, we're going to help that warfighter and figure out how, what is the best way to get ourselves uh, back out of Afghanistan the most efficient way possible. And that's really uh, uh, what we need to do in the, in the second stage of the plan. Uh, also, when you look at the conditions in, in Iraq, who's ever transitioned an operation with the Department of State? There's not too many hands going up. Well, we didn't do that in Japan, we didn't do that in Germany, we didn't do that in Korea, we didn't do that in uh, Grenada, we didn't do that. So now we're going to transition an army over to the Department of State. Well, guess what? I went to pull that plan off the shelf, it wasn't there. <laughs> so we're writing that plan as we speak, and we're working very closely with the uh, USFI as well as the State Department uh, in figuring out, we're having weekly VTCs to figure this one out, because it will not be easy, the conditions have changed. Slide. Well, guess what? Hard to read slide, and I apologize, but so we said we got to we got to write start writing this stuff down. I mean, there's a lot going on today, and we've got to figure this out. That big bubble on the left, basically, that's the team. Uh, General Phillips and General Pillsbury and General Stevenson all alluded to. It takes a whole bunch of people to make this stuff happen. And around the outer ring there, those are just some of the great organizations that make it happen every day. As you work yourself inward. You, you find yourself involved in four major processes. One, process management. Who's there to help me? I've got AAA there to help me. I've got the DODIG there to help me. I've got, uh, uh, you name the oversight committee, GAO. They're all there to help and, uh, and work this out. You move to the right, distribution. That's a complex business called distribution. And you look at all the players and the things that are going on on the G-locks, the A-locks, setting up uh, central receiving points, uh, DLA, Defense Logistics Agency. Uh, so there's all sorts of integration that has to occur. The bottom right, material accountability. Everything we have got to maintain great uh, pro property accountability. And I'll tell you, we didn't do it right early on. And that's no fault to anybody because what? We need to get in there. We need to get the mission accomplished. But guess what? The taxpayer wants to know. GAO wants to know. Where's all my property? I sent $87 billion worth of stuff over there. Uh, do you have the systems, the mechanisms, and the people there to make sure that we've got good accountability? We're working through that. And, uh, and regaining that accountability. And then finally, that bottom left there, contracts. General Phillips, you know, eloquently put, there is a lot to do with contracts. I, if I could uh, reshape my career back uh, 27 years ago, I probably would have spent a heck of a lot. I would have stayed awake in that class, that's for sure, uh, contracting. It, it seems complicated, but it's not once you get your head in the game and you can figure it out and you get the right people and they're working it, then uh, you can be successful at it. So those are, in my mind, the sort of the pillars to what we call set the theater. And then everything shifts right on that, uh, and you're all familiar with the next four columns there of develop and manage requirements, optimize capacity, deliver and sustain forces, manage transition. Probably the biggest thing we're doing right now is managing transition. 
and that will create the steady state end state uh, requirements and uh, and that's what it's all balanced on is what is the warfighters requirements what is my capacity to, to handle those requirements and oh by the way do I have the capability that I leverage off a of big army as third army uh, to support the, the warfighters operational needs so again this is a complex process very simply put teamwork plus the plan equals some level of steady state support and allows you to achieve an end state but it's a very complex business slide ah this is my favorite one stayed up late one night doing this one reverse logistics who's ever done reverse logistics who's ever read about reverse logistics okay this is where we're at today this was a model off of HP and I also had an article that I was reading this morning from Cisco um, industry today is standing up this business called reverse logistics there is huge who's ever been to Walmart return section okay I know I have been several times you walk into that return section you just take for granted what it took to turn that item over to the receptionist there at Walmart what where did that product go decisions had to be made on every single item that you turned into that counter by that uh, by Walmart that item might find itself at another store it might find itself being disposed of it might find itself going back to the manufacturer well guess what we're doing in the army today we're doing reverse logistics I've got organizations forward that are doing disposition army materiel command working back with the TACOM life cycle management commands and all of the LCMC's work through this process of where do I send that piece of equipment well that's our Walmart return section is we've got a major this is a multi-billion dollar industry is turning the equipment around and sending it back the other way we've got to do it better our systems aren't designed to go in reverse it's like a car who's ever driven hundred miles an hour before I know I have okay I've gotten a few tickets along the way however you put the car in reverse how fast can you go you've got to do all sorts of things you got to turn around you got to watch where you go you can't talk on your cell phone you can't do all those other things you got to concentrate on going backwards well that's what this engine's doing right now is it's in reverse and it's cycling backwards so that's what this gets after is basically saying we've got as an army understand what's going on out there and there are people that have done this and have done it successfully in industry and that's uh, kind of what we're doing is figuring out ways to uh, handle equipment and property slide so we we understand now what we're trying to do in this thing called reverse logistics the processes involved well we needed a tool to give us what I would term situational understanding not situational awareness but I needed to understand exactly what had to happen in order for us to make a better informed decision to analyze the problem to integrate that problem and we stood up an automated tool called the RSET theater common operating tool it's basically a uh, intelligent uh, business Oracle database where we leverage from the stamuses at the top of the chart as they work down through all of the uh, information data uh, integrated servers at the national level all the way into the logistics uh, information warehouse LIW partnered with uh, LOGSA and Pat Sullivan's great team uh, to build a capability that allowed me to reach out and see this business is about visibility at the end of the day I gotta know where everything is and if I don't then I can't make an informed decision and the tools that I was trying to leverage off of the GCCS Army is gonna be that tool for us eventually when it gets fielded out there we get all the training we get the people informed to how to, how to leverage it well we had a capability here that we designed to do that and you can see from the systems capability and more importantly from the outputs those are the things that I needed now to, to give the commander a status of where everything was on the battlefield and that's a great tool that uh, again working close with our, our partners at the uh, logs uh, to make happen but you got to manage the complexity that's what this business is all about is this is a complex business we're involved in and it takes tools and understanding of processes and more importantly the the young energetic uh, logisticians that are out there making this happen and giving them the tools to do it slide so bottom line uh, looking ahead uh, redistributing uh, permission an army reset we know we're part of a bigger engine and uh, we've got to feed that uh, with requirement we sent back 18,000 pieces of rolling stock class 7 doubled our volume from last year that just didn't happen we had to put the systems the people the processes in place uh, leveraging off of AMC with the uh, reset task force uh, because certainly our systems were not structured to do that originally so again uh, 
The second bullet there is good stewardship. Uh, they are out there trying to do the right thing every day. Those soldiers are working hard to make sure that they understand that these are taxpayer dollars that were spent on very important, complex pieces of equipment, and we've got to do our darnest to make sure that we've got good property accountability. Leverage industry. Nobody does it better. At the end of the day, we're a Fortune 400 company, and we've got to act like one. We've got to make sure that our systems, our people, our processes are there to work in reverse, and that's what we're trying to do today. But those soldiers are out there working extremely hard to do what's right and making sure they're good stewards of your uh, tax dollars. Coalition capability and goodwill. We know we can't do this alone. It takes our coalition partners side by side to work through this complexity and make this uh, logistics business happen because it is not going to happen on its own. We've got to learn from each other, and, and we're doing that every day. And finally, like my boss says, you know, supporting mission, people, teamwork. We have got to be ready tonight. Uh, we, we know the call's coming. It's right around the corner. We're going to get this one just about right, and the new complexity is going to hit a square right between the eye, and we're going to be moving out to the next, uh, the next objective. So, again, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning, and I look forward to your questions. This brings us to the, my favorite part of these panels anyway. It's a chance to interact with you all and, and see what's on your mind. But while you were thinking, General Solomon lead, led off with the first three questions, so I'll, I'll uh, take a shot at, at one of those and pass the other two to my partners to my left. Uh, first question was, uh, who makes the decision on where the repair of equipment uh, will be that is being reset? Um, good question. Uh, Way back uh, five, six years ago, we began to answer that question with something called the Automatic Reset Induction List. And we got the idea, I was in AMC at the time as the G3, we got the idea from looking at what we did with helicopters as they came back. Every helicopter that came back from the desert, we realized it had been through a significant experience in the heat and the dust and the, uh, and the, the very huge op tempo over there. And so we knew we would have to bring each of those helicopters back to a systematic teardown inspection and repair of the helicopters. And it occurred to us that, you know, it's probably not only helicopters that have that problem. So do firefinder radars. So do generators in general. And as we began to tear down some of the combat vehicles that we got back from the desert, we realized that, you know, unless you pull the turret off and look inside the racer ring, you don't really know what's happened inside there in all of that dust and terrible climate. And so we, we worked our way around to, and this list has evolved year after year after year. We just published the FY11 ARI listing that says, if it's one, on this list, when you get back, give it directly to AMC. And they will either through their DOLs, through their FLRCs, or through their depots, or through perhaps an OEM, uh, reset it for you, and you won't have to worry about it. Uh, another thing that, that AMC did, uh, right toward the tail end of my watch was something General Griffin started called the Small Arms uh, Repair and Inspection Teams, the SERIT teams. And basically what it involved is sending the depot to the installation and taking over all of their weapons for, for a BCT that's returned, putting them through a depot level inspection. These are the guys that repair weapons in the depots. They had a bunch of extra weapons with them so that if they got to one that they couldn't repair because they didn't have the tooling there, they just simply swapped it out. And we do that now for every weapon that comes back. It's gotten to be very popular. We're also doing it with communications, electronics equipment, and NBC equipment. So we got a number of programs, the automatic re uh, reset induction listing, these teams that go out from AMC. And if it's not in, in one of those programs, then who does the reset is the unit that owns the equipment. And there's some of that, of course, that goes on as well. So I hope that answers the question. I'll pass the next two questions to, uh, to Jim and to Bill. Uh, there's been talk of depots having first right of refusal. Um, are we, where are we on that? A and it's, it's a great question, but within the material enterprise collaborative council that um, I sat in on, I guess about six, eight weeks ago, Bill, with uh, Dr. O'Neill and General Phillips and General Dunwoody, um, we brought that up and General, and, and that, that when a PM says, uh, I need to have something overhauled uh, does the PM have to go to the depot? No, doesn't have to. Uh, 
but uh, Dr. O'Neill thinks that's a good idea, and and there is work being done within ASALT to have that uh, uh, put into policy. Now, that being said, if our depots aren't competitive, then we're wasting money. Uh, the the PM has got to be able to be as efficient and effective as he or she uh, can be uh, with with the taxpayers' dollars. So, uh, and I see a couple of depot commanders and dep deputies out here. They know that they have to be as lean and as uh, agile as, as any OEM or better to be able to uh, be competitive for the work that goes into um, depot overhaul. If that answers your question, yes, sir. Bill? Sir, I have a third one. And, sir, we had a deal. You were going to give all the hard questions <laughs> to uh, Jim Pillsbury. So. But who will prepare the RFPs for the work to be done by the contractor? Uh, the PM or the contracting command. Uh, sir, some of my personal thoughts go into this as well, having worked this for many years, but it's sometimes a, a, not a simple answer. Overall, the uh, contracting officer is going to prepare that contract that includes the specifications, statement of work, and all the clauses that go inside of it are the responsibility of the contracting officer. In my view, they are the ones that, that ultimately have the role of making sure that it's right. But it takes an incredible team effort to be able to get an RFP uh, correct, as correct as we can get it before we release it for industry. And part of the challenge we have is working through the requirements, it might be a CDD or an ICD or something, translation, translating that into specifications. So when I mention team effort, uh, sometimes it involves TRADOC and the uh, center of excellence that has overall responsibility for that item. And it might involve TRADOC headquarters like we're working. Yesterday we spoke a lot about ground combat vehicle. And there's a lot of great work between TRADOC, Army Material Command, ASALT, bringing together the right kinds of folks to ensure that this RFP has what it needs inside of it. So the contracting officer at the end of the day has to rely upon key subject matter experts across a broad community that includes a look really at the life cycle of that program because the life cycle of that program is going to be inside the specifications and the statement of work that the contracting officer is going to issue. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one more time. It's important that we give industry as clear, as clear and concise guidance as we can uh, when we do issue that RFP. But in my mind, it's the contracting officer, sir. Okay, so I'd like to open the floor up to uh, other questions. We've got some mics here in the center of the room so that uh, if you have a question, I'd ask that you come forward uh, and grab one of the mics, either the one in the front or the one in the back, and, uh, and lay it on us. We're all yours. Don't everybody move at once. Ah, we got a couple. A couple of takers. Good. Um, General Stevenson, you mentioned again uh, nine years of combat operations. So if I could ask you and your fellow panelists, go back 10 years, and at that time you all had certain beliefs of certain things that were absolutely critical for sustainment and support during combat operations. I would suspect that that's changed. And so I'd be interested in uh, general principles, themes. After all, it's a general officer panel, and it's probably good to ask general questions, uh, that what you've seen that's changed from 10 years ago to now. Um, that, that is a good question. I, let me take a shot at it, and then I'd ask my compatriots to, uh, to help out. I, I think the fundamentals are sound in, in field, tactical, and strategic level logistics. Um, we did do a transformation uh, early on in the, in the effort where we changed how we organized for logistics. You know, in, in, uh, as we went into the war and into both Iraq and Afghanistan, we had DISCOMs in divisions. Um, and we had COSCOMs for corps, and of course we had theater area commands for, for theater armies. Um, we streamlined that quite a bit, starting in 2004 with, with the transformation of Army logistics, and we put it into place by about 2006, and have been operating that way ever since. But the fundamentals, you know, uh, being about planning, um, obtaining the right balance between stockage positioning versus distribution, what goes by air, what goes by ground. Um, we, we certainly learned, I learned a big lesson 
in terms of, you know, historically it's been our doctrine that we fly repair parts. We learned this as a result of a study back in the early 70s that was done. Uh, sir, you, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. Um, where it, it turns out in the long run it's cheaper to fly repair parts as a general rule uh, than it is to establish stockage positions forward in a theater uh, at the multiple levels that we do uh, in the Army. Um, and so it's always been our doctrine that we fly repair parts. The volume at which we were flying got to be pretty expensive for us. Still very doable, but expensive. And it turns out through some work that we do with RAND, and, we've, and as you know, uh, the RAND Corporation, the Royal Center, has been very involved in Army logistics and helping, our, helping us think our way through things. They came to us and said, you know, there's probably some middle ground here. You shouldn't fly at all, nor should you stock it all forward, but there's a middle ground here, and we'll help you develop an algorithm that figures out what's best uh, to, stock it, to stock forward. For, and, and a quick example is you would think that Big, heavy things would be the things you'd want to stock forward because they consume a lot of airlift. And so by that logic, what you would do is make sure you had plenty of Apache engines stock forward and you'd replenish it, sending the, the replenishment by surface. It turns out that is actually the more expensive way to approach it. The smart thing to do is fly Apache engines. It almost seems counterintuitive. But you have to build up such a huge stockage to account for the pipeline, uh, surface pipeline, that you make an enormous in inventory investment. On the other hand, batteries for vehicles, the standard battery that you see in every vehicle, are incredibly expensive to fly over because we have such large volume, but they're so damn cheap. Just stock a bunch of them forward in theater and, you, and then replenish that by surface and then you've literally eaten into your, your load. Uh, so that's been a real big lesson for us um, and, and one that we won't forget and that we're now incorporating into how we think about strategic level logistics um, around the world. Um, so in, in, in that sense, I guess there are, and the more I sit here talking and reminiscing, I, I'm starting to get other ideas about things that we have learned, lessons that we have learned, but the fundamentals of uh, good command and control, understanding distribution, the balance between stockage positioning and, and distribution uh, are sound and, and have served us well in this war. Other guys? I got three things. Um, I wouldn't have thought that that the uh, the transformation within AMC would have been this dramatic and this successful to include Army Sustainment Command and the Army Field Support Brigades that take wholesale logistics down to the tactical level, and the linkage there has been phenomenal. Um, and and I, I could talk to you offline on that for for hours. Secondly, uh, who would have thought in 2002 that contracting officer representatives would become so critical um, to the tune of now that's a requirement before Forces Command will uh, certify a unit to a BCT to deploy, they must have 80, a minimum of 80 trained CORs uh, within their formations. And lastly, who would have thought 10 years ago, and I'm looking at A. David Mills and, and the AMC team, that our depots would be this busy, both inside the fence and, as Mitch mentioned, outside the fence. It, that, that workload required us to become more lean. If we had not changed our, our um, mentality within the fence, and Frank Zardecki uh, may or may not agree with this, it, that, but the absolute mountain of work forced us to get better, and I would not have seen that uh, 10 years ago. Okay, at the risk of allowing an Irishman who's had three cups of coffee to speak <laughs> again. Bill, Dad. Bill, you're going to let Bill? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Bill. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jack, you can go ahead. No, please, please. Uh, just a couple of thoughts to add what uh, Mitch and Jim have already said. Not a lesson learned, but I, I would couch this in terms of a validation. I think the visionary leadership of our Army is reflective in how we responded to the needs of OEF and OIF. And I look at it from the pers perspective of being in G8FD, arriving there in April of 2001 and serving in FD, working on the QDR when we had numerous challenges to Army force structure and Army leadership fought the good fight all the way to when they were getting ready to sign the QDR and then 9-11 happened and the world changed. 
And I think it's a reflection upon, really, General Shinseki, I'll start with him, and Stryker, and how we built Stryker over time to be able to fight in any, in a full spectrum uh, operation. Stryker today has probably, it used to be 12 million miles, I don't know how many it is now, it's probably over 15 million in both theaters of operation, and has done simply remarkable work. That was a visionary change that General Shinseki saw. General Schoomaker under modularity, same kind of change. But I, having spent three and a half years in FD and watching and trying to resource the fight between 2001 and September of 04 when I left, uh, the one thing that is a lesson learned is some of our traditional processes, I'll call them bureaucratic, bureaucratic processes inside the building, do not, do not support the need for rapid processes or speed. The operational needs process, the ONS process, and the JUONS process was necessary before 1st CAV and other, you know, 4ID and others, 3ID ever got into the fight into Iraq, for us to be able to provide those last items of equipment that units needed to go forth and fight the battle. And to the last minute before 3rd ID crossed the berm, we were trying to get blue force tracking on as many vehicles as we could and thermal panels on the side of Bradley's. So, and we did that on the fly and we responded very rapidly. But if you look at the ONS process, and that's very rapid acquisition of items to get them in the hands of warfighters. And you look at our deliberate process to acquire things today. We do deliberate very well, but it takes seven years maybe for a, a combat vehicle. Ons, we can work as quickly as we can find the item and get it in the hands and ship it over there and get it. In the middle is somewhere where the truth probably lies. So a big lesson for me having watched this is how can we take advantage of operational needs statements and how we work that in our deliberate processes to somehow uh, reform the way that we do uh, operations uh, or we execute the acquisition of items. Thanks, Bill. Jack. Yes, sir. And, and quickly, I jotted down as that question was being asked, one, process management, two, end-to-end -end visibility, three, commercial off the shelf, and then I said, well, those are all really big subsets in, in sort of what you just heard in the, in the previous answers of resource management. So when you look at 10 years ago, working under a thing called a budget, we don't have a budget at war. We have things called OCO. And, we, and so we operate under a, what we now term a cost culture. And we've set up ways to manage costs because do I get the Escalade or do I get the Durango? Do I get this or do I get that? So now we've got to shape a decision of a young lieutenant up to a general officer trying to manage costs on the battlefield so that we provide the right capability at the right time. We, at Third Army, we've got a $26 billion budget, essentially. And our job is to work within the confines of what are the costs, and we've set up boards and you know coalition acquisition review boards, JFUBs, the facility utilization board. So really something that you don't train for early on, but in this environment of resource management is what it all boils down to is you